I'm Anne from Book Carnival, and we're delighted to welcome Linwood Barclay to us. Um, Zooming this time, he has been at Book Carnival in the past, and we look forward to hopefully doing that again sometime in person. And we're going to talk about his new book, Find You First. Uh, the premise is fascinating. Um, my first reaction when I read the first couple of lines of the blurb by Stephen King, no less, I was impressed with that, was he's going to go look for the children now? <laughs> um, why? <laughs> uh, and Really? Uh, and then it, you know, obviously you with your usual twists and turns, uh, you've just made it fascinating. Thank you. Yes, this was a, this was a fun book to write. Um, it's, uh, I guess how I sum it up, it's, we, it's you know, to, to describe it, it's about a fellow named Miles, who's a tech guy who's made a fortune. He's in his early 40s and uh, never married. And he's learned that, you know, money will buy everything except time. And because he's learned that he has a, a terminal illness. And they say, well, it's a good thing you never had kids because what you've got, there's a 50% chance it would get passed on. Uh, and and what now what the doctor doesn't know is that he was a sperm donor years ago and and there could be any number of kids out there so after some soul searching he thinks well i should find these these children of mine and sort of first of all warn them and who am i going to leave my fortune to and as he begins on this quest to find these these individuals that turns out there appear to be nine of them uh, they all start vanishing one by one before he can get to them um, and uh, and that's that's the pitch. That's the story. You always have. Um, I love your writing because you always come up with this supposedly simple thing that's going to happen, but then it turns out not to be simple at all. <laughs> yes. Uh, all of your books are are like that. Not that they're the same, but that however you want your however you stage your characters. They have such normal lives until they don't. Yeah, and I like to write about, um, you know, uh, typically the the protagonists in my books are not cops or detectives or ex CIA types or Jack Reacher types or anything like that. <laughs> they are they're just ordinary people who have sort of one extraordinary thing happen to them that's not very pleasant. So they're not they're these are the kind of people who are not in any way equipped to deal with the kind of people that they're, they're going to run up against. So it's like, you know, if I read, and I love Lee Child, if I read a Lee Child book, I'm not worried for Jack Reacher, I'm worried for everybody who Google and encounter him. Uh, <laughs> but, I'm, but, but my characters, like, they're not, they don't have the skills to deal with, to deal with bad people. Right. Well, you know what? It's kind of nice that not everybody is a badass, you know? Yeah. Everybody, they, they got a really, people you don't want to meet at all yep that's right that's right so, so it's like sometimes people say well you're going to bring that character back for something else and i think well i can only do something really bad to them really i think once because this would be this is a kind of singular event that happens in their lives and so i it's not it's it's not very often that i will bring those kinds of characters back in for another book no i think it's smart not to um Although you wrote, uh, you've written a couple of small series that um, the first one that I ever read of yours was hilarious. Uh, the husband who insisted on doing everything wrong. Yes, this, yes. So I did, that's right. I did four books about a character named Zach Walker. Yeah. Um, bad Move, Bad Guys, Lone Wolf and Stone Rain uh, were the four of them. And, and Zach was this sort of well-intentioned pain in the ass who was a uh, sort of anxiety riddled individual. He's the kind of guy who changes the smoke detectors at least three months too early. And we're all kind of worried about all kinds of things. And uh, this, this behavior of his has a way of backfiring spectacularly. So I did four books about that character and they're books I'm quite proud of, but at the time that I did them, they were not big sellers. They were not successful books. Hmm. And <clears throat> so, well, after I'd done the four of them, it was my agent that said, you know, I, she recommended that I not do, not keep doing a series and not write funny. Because, you know, funny thrillers are, there There aren't very many of them 
that become sort of bestsellers. There's, oh, okay. you, you know, you can count on one hand sort of the writers, like there's Janet Ivanovich and there's Carl Hyacin. And now I'm already running out of ideas, people who are, <laughs> you know, there are lots of people who write very funny thrillers, and funny stuff, but they don't necessarily hit, hit the big times. And, <clears throat> you know, we had Donna Westlake, who was a genius, so he's no longer with us. And so so uh, she suggested that I kind of switch gears. And so uh, that, the, the, the fifth book I wrote was a book called No Time for Goodbye. And that one kind of went supernova. It was a massive bestseller in Germany. Right. It and, was amazing. And even bigger bestseller in the UK. That book got picked by a TV show in England called Richard and Judy. It was like getting being picked by Oprah. And so that book was the single best-selling novel of the year in 2008 in, uh, in the UK. So that's, that was kind of that book that got me going, you know, mm -hmm. that fifth one. And that's when I left my, that's when I decided to leave my newspaper job and just do books full time. I it made me very happy when you decided to do that. I, I've enjoyed everything you've written. And you, while you don't make your character now, any of them really funny, funny, but you have humor in your books. Yeah, I like to, yeah. Cause you know, when I wrote the Zach Walker novels, the situations were kind of designed to lend themselves slightly to sort of farcical events or funny events. Whereas now I think humor mostly just comes out of dialogue when this sort of the repartee between people, often when they're kind of at their wits end and they're, they're just kind of snap or just sarcasm. And I think that's where the humor comes in as opposed to just sort of silly situations and so forth. You know, I think it was like, I think in, um, I did a book called Bad Guys, one of Zach ones, and I had a thug who collected Barbie dolls. You know, like it was just, what's a really weird thing that a guy could do? And, and so that's, this was the kind of character that was for a Zach book. You know. I love the uh, staying with Zach for a minute. I love the one where he took the wrong purse out of the shopping cart. Well, that's the first one. That's the one that really establishes his character. That was and hilarious. That, and that all came. I mean, we can all thank my my wife, Nita, for that, because when we go when we would go to the grocery store, she'll always leave her purse in the little fold up kitty seat. And and then and then leave the cart there and wander halfway down the aisle to grab <laughs> something and come back and this and you know and it's sitting open you can see the it just drives me crazy because I think well why don't I just take my wallet out and just leave it there for somebody too to take <laughs> and and I thought what if I took her purse and put it in the car pretend and pretended that it had been stolen then that would teach her a lesson to never wander you know leave it unattended and I decided not to do that because I wanted to live. And, <laughs> Wise decision. And, Smart but I, man. <laughs> it's, but then I thought, well, what if I were the kind of guy who would do that? And so that was the, was the beginning of Zach. And Zach, after we established his pattern of behavior, we reached the point in the book where he does this and takes the purse and puts it in the trunk of the car and, they, and they've left and so forth. And it's only then that he realized that his wife doesn't carry a purse anymore. She has one of these little fanny packs that's sort of belted to the front. And so now it's like, well, whose purse is in the trunk of the car? He, <laughs> the, he went to the wrong cart. And so that is really sort of the first domino in a series of catastrophic events that come from that, that case of bad judgment. He was fun to write about that guy. And I have to say that, you know, he, I hate, you know, he's, as I say, Zach is this, was this kind of pain in the ass, anal retentive, anxiety riddled person. And I hate to tell you who he's based on. He's just basically me unchecked. <laughs> I don't believe that for a minute. Yeah. That's um, what yeah. The, uh, getting back to your current book, which is your blurbs were wonderful. You must have been thrilled with Stephen King throwing in that one. Yeah, here it is. Here it is, folks. Find you first. There it is. And yes, here's the blurb from Steve. He says, uh, starts with a bang and ends with an even bigger one. It's the best book of his career. I couldn't put it down. Now, I don't know if it's the best book I ever did, but it seems rude to argue, you know. <laughs> and, uh, but he, um, uh, we've sort of become email pals over the years. I've met him a couple times. And he was emailing me as he was reading it. Oh, uh, he said, and so he was, he really did love it. So we were very grateful to have that 
quote for the cover. Was he emailing you to tell you parts he enjoyed or to give you suggestions? Just that, no, 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 just that he was <laughs> loving it and, and, uh, and related, related a story that I probably won't pass on, but it had to do, he did, he, he didn't do the type of donation that Miles does in the book, but he had a, a young age uh, donated blood for money. And, mm -hmm. uh, and so he was relating some tales like that, but no, he just, he did really, he really liked it. Um, That's great. Uh, yeah. So that was very, very nice to hear. What are, what kind of research did you do for this and, and where did you do it? Because you were still on lockdown, right? Oh, yeah. But, you know, I mean, the Internet's a wonderful thing. You know, it's just I mean, I didn't I would say that uh, the research that I did that was sort of the most critical was I needed to find for the purposes of the plot an illness for my main character that was, first of all, terminal, that could happen within a reasonable length of time that he might, he might pass on. And that also was a high probability that it would be passed on to offspring. And I have a very good friend named John who lives in Seattle, who's a scientist, doctor. Uh, he's worked with Bill Gates. He's been working on COVID. He does all stuff. So I would, so he was my, he's my, in matters of this kind, he's the guy I go to. And I said, what, falls what what meets these these requirements for this plot line <clears throat> excuse me and he came up with huntington's he thought huntington's sort of met the bill for what i had to, what i was going to write about but he's really helpful when i was doing a book called the 23 a few years ago a few years ago there it is right now right here on the shelf so this was the this was the third uh book of the promise falls trilogy so Hi. so i said to him this is what i love about a guy who's a scientist i said to him how would you go about killing everybody in a town? And he went like this. Yeah, I know how to do that. Just like that. <laughs> so <laughs> it's, it's very helpful. It's funny, we were sitting, we were sitting in a Starbucks in Seattle and we were Googling the, the, uh, the names of certain potentially fatal chemicals. And even as we did it, he thought, he was just waiting for, for somebody to come to the door and raid the place and get us because yeah. <laughs> and the fact and the fact that no one did tells me that that homeland security is not as on the ball as they should be. <laughs> but was anybody looking at you funny that was sitting around you? No, no. There well, there's a lot of funny people in Seattle anyway, but there was uh, but no, nobody took any notice of us. We just we just sat there and this was the other part I thought was so funny. He's such a scientific minded guy. <clears throat> and I said, well. It had to do with the poisoning of water. And I said, well, how many gallons does a typical town's water tower hold? And so he gets out his little notepad and he's doing circumference and A over Y times X equals, and he starts doing all this sort of stuff. I just went on the computer and Googled how many gallons in a water <laughs> tower. <laughs> I had the answer, I said. So... <laughs> I noticed also that um, over the years, and you did one in 2019, you do nonfiction. Well, not, I've done a couple things. The, the book I did in um, 2019, that must be Ford Abomination. Is that the one we're talking about? Yes. So that's here. I'm so handy in the bookshelf today. Yes, so it is. I and you can reach it. When I was in, when I worked in newspapers, the last 14 years I was in, in newspapers at Toronto Star, I was a so-called humor columnist allegedly a humor columnist. And so I did a lot of political satire. And uh, back in 1998, I wrote a satirical book about the uh, premier of Ontario, the equivalent of your governor, um, a guy named Mike Harris, who we all loathe. I wrote a book about him. And, and then that publisher said to me that if I wanted to do a book about the current premier of Ontario, it was a guy named Doug Ford, he'd print it because he's a bit of a, a, a buffoon, I guess would be the word. So I did this, so I did, he, and he has, his fans are called Ford Nation. His name is Doug Ford, and they call his fans, and people who love him, Ford Nation. So we did oh, a book called Ford Abomination. <laughs> and with, it's a very scholarly book because it not only has cartoons, but it has, it has footnotes. And okay. um, so I did that, so that's, but you know, that's a very localized kind of a thing. 
And I did do a memoir back in 21 years ago called Last Resort that was nonfiction. What, is, what about the how, this house is nuts? Oh, we don't even talk about that. Okay. <laughs> no, no, that's, okay. That's a, that was just a, collect, that's a collection of columns that I wrote for the Toronto Star. Uh, just sort of family type, domestic, funny stuff. That's all that one was. Okay. But that was, that was a long, I think that came out in 1997. That's a long time ago. That's not on my resume anymore. Though. <laughs> Everything's on the computer. You know that. Oh, I know. It's not, <laughs> some things you can't hide. What um, what are you planning next? I'm sure you're already working or, on something or maybe have it finished by now. I have sort of, actually have sort of three things on the go at the moment. Um, there'll be actually two books for me within the next 12 months. Yay. One of them, one of them may only be an ebook or might be print in some regions. We'll see. So first of all, there's, there's my, the kind of usual thriller that you would expect from me every year. That'll be out next spring, probably May-ish, somewhere in there. Uh, we, haven't, we haven't nailed down a title yet, but the book is done. I've done a major second draft on it. And so, you know, there's a little bit of tweaking to do, but that book is done. <clears throat> and the other book, the one that'll be an ebook, we do have a title for. Uh, it's called Look Both Ways. And uh, I wrote this book, I must have written it three years ago, and we've been trying to figure out what to do with it ever since, because it's more, it's not the kind of book I typically do, it's more like what I'd call a Michael Crichton kind of book. Okay. It's, so let's, you know, I would describe it as think Jurassic Park, but instead of dinosaurs, it's self- Oh, I bet my earbuds are in my Rose, chair. Rose, you have to mute yes. yourself. Okay. Sorry, Lemma. That's okay. I was going to say it's, it's, uh, I I'm trying to mute her from my side and I can't do it there. Uh, okay. I'll see you. Um, yeah, I describe it as sort of uh, Jurassic Park with, but without that, but instead of dinosaurs and self driving cars, the premise for this book is a, a Martha's Vineyard kind of a community is a test site for a major car company that makes self-driving cars. And the best way to test autonomous vehicles is if every road, every car on the road is one because they all communicate with each other. They'd have a kind of hive mind and so you don't have accidents. So everyone agrees to, for a period of a month, surrender all the real cars, normal cars to the mainland. And everybody gets one of these, these self-driving cars. And then a virus gets introduced into the system and all the cars essentially become homicidal. And it's like an island with a thousand Christines on it. And so because that book was so different than what I typically do, um, the publisher's like, well, you know, we like it, but we don't want to do it. So we're finally going to bring it out. And in some markets, like in the UK and others, we may, they may bring it out in print and others may be an ebook. So anyway, that's coming. And... And finally, the other thing that I'm actually working on at the moment is I am, I did a book a few years ago called Fear the Worst. And mm -hmm. um, I have uh, I've written a, a screenplay adaptation for it that Jason Priestley wants to produce and star in. And we now have a director who wants to direct it. And so that I'm working on another draft of that based on director's notes. And then once we have all of these things together, we're going to hit, you know, knock on the door of Netflix and Amazon and so forth and see if we can get this thing made. So, so I've been the last few days, I'm working on this other, this latest draft of, uh, of the screenplay. So, so I have those things away. And then of course, once we reach sort of September, October, I have to start writing another book. <laughs> and um, I have an idea of what I want to do, but I haven't had time because of these other things to sort of sit down and start thinking how it will actually work. But I have lots of time for that. That's great. Uh, yeah. It's so wonderful to know that there's so much more coming from you. Oh, and yeah, hopefully, you know, hopefully when you can tour, you'll be able to get down to the States. That'd be nice. Yeah. You know, I would typically have done a, probably done a, a quick U S tour anyway for this book. And I almost always do a UK tour and uh, we'll hit Scotland and Ireland and so forth and didn't do that. That would have, that book came out, the book came out in February there. So I'm hoping fingers crossed, maybe it'll be at least a UK tour next year. 
for, mm-hmm. uh, for this new book when it comes out. Um, but uh, and everything feels so unpredictable. We, we feel like we're so close. We're finally getting there. And then we keep worrying about slipping back. And I'm hoping that that's not going to happen. And I should yeah. probably, for those who have more recently joined, will still explain that it's been, hasn't been a barbershop, haven't been open <laughs> in Toronto since November 25th. And they reopened on Wednesday. So this is finally going to be disappearing soon enough. <laughs> you look just like all of the rest of our authors did. Yeah, I know that's right. We don't. We don't have. We, we just. We grooming is not big for us, you know. <laughs> um, what else? Uh, is there anything else you'd like to tell us about your book that is out now? Well. Um, You know, a lot of people have pointed out or want to point out that there seems to be a character in it who might or might not be slightly inspired by Mr. Jeffrey Epstein. And, um, you know, when I started writing this book and and we had this plot line of a guy who's trying to find his his the the children from his sperm donation 20 years ago. And they start, as I say, start disappearing one by one. And it it seemed very logical that perhaps one of those heirs was knocking off the others so as to receive a greater share of the estate. And I thought, well, that makes perfect sense, but maybe there's another story running parallel to this. And that's when I started thinking about uh, Mr. Epstein. And um, so I have a character who's actually in the first draft was actually closer to him. And then in the second draft, we kind of changed it some, but we have a very wealthy New York guy who has uh, more money than you could possibly imagine and has the goods on all sorts of people and in his pocket and is a very, very nasty piece of work. And so, uh, but he also is a bit of an eccentric because he, when he was a, a youngster, his parents would travel in an RV across the country. And so he has installed into his, the top floor of his brownstone a Winnebago on the top floor in this big expansive uh, office because it's just a kind of kitschy, neat thing. And I just, I thought, I somewhere I had seen an article, like an architectural digest or something about an artist who had put an Airstream trailer in a loft. And I thought that was so cool. And of course, <laughs> part, of my, part of my background is as a teenager, I essentially ran a cottage resort and trailer park in Canada. So traders have this little, I have this little soft spot in my heart for traders. So I, I've managed to work. I this, this the first novel I've done where I've been been able to work in a Winnebago as a main character. <laughs> I love it. You, your characters have well, your characters have usually been the threatened ones, and the uh, in all of your books, they're the ones at risk. Your yeah. main character. Um, I can't, and help my memory, I can't really remember you having a very nasty uh, character in any of your books. As a main character, you mean? Right, or even a strong supporting one. Oh, that's a good question. I think there's certainly the nastiest one I've ever done would be in the current book, I would say. And, um, And I think part of that might be is that I think in the in the real world, a lot of the people who do the most unspeakable things often just act and look like the rest of us, mm-hmm. you know. And that's the scary part of it in a lot of ways. Is it's you know, it's your guy next door, and it's the one that never seemed to be any trouble, and he's the one who goes off the deep end. So you know, I don't do villains who are sort of twirling their mustaches kind of thing. You know, there's no snidely whiplash kind of guy because they're very cartoonish anyway. And, you know, the, a lot of the, like I say, the, some of the, the was that, what was that phrase that was it Hannah Aaron said, the banality of evil, that some of the most evil people are the most ordinary. Mm-hmm. Which makes them the scariest, of course. Yeah, it really does. Um, you know, and speaking, I have to say this, because this is funny, just because it's speaking of scary. So in the last few days, we've become a, addicted to yeah, one of these zombie shows on Netflix called Black Summer. And I've had my fill of zombie shows, but this is really, it's something about it, it's really good. So we're nearly finished the second season, which just landed. And we'd watched two episodes tonight and we only had one left and we'd seen all of it. I said, let's watch the next one. Let's do it. And we just get ready to watch it. And my wife said, don't you have an event at nine? 
<laughs> just the time of this year. And I went, because I've been all day, I've been thinking, I'm doing book carnival tonight. I'm going to be doing book. And so, and then once we got, it was just completely absorbed by the show. And then she said, you know, I think you have an event in 20 minutes. Like, so, <laughs> I, but I know you have emailed or something if there'd been a problem. Oh, yes. And I would have sat here patiently waiting because I know Linwood wouldn't stand me up. I would never do that. No. no. You know, it's been wonderful. Uh, Linwood, I, I miss you. I love your work. Thank you. Um, we're going to have lots of sales of books. They, several were ordered. I'm sorry not more people showed up tonight, but it's, it's not predictable anymore. Well, well, it's nice to see you. Let's record it so they'll get to see it. I think that's where I'm spoiling them. They get to see the recording. Well, you know, nobody watches things these days when they actually come on. <laughs> so that's true. It's true. It's true. I, know. I, mean, yeah. I, don't, I haven't stayed up to watch Jimmy Kimmel in, you know, 10 years, but I'll get up in the morning and I'll see the best clips. <laughs> and you can fast forward through all the commercials. Absolutely. Yep. Yes, we don't have any of those tonight, do we? No commercials. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. Except for books. Except for books. This is okay. Oh, this well, is, they're important. This, is, this will make your clothes cleaner than you've ever imagined. This is what these are for. <laughs> <laughs> Linwood, thank you so much for being with us. It has Next been time. Okay. Nice, nice to see you. Take care. Bye bye now. Bye bye. Thank you.